So hello everyone, thank you all for coming. And for those who don't know me, I'm Leno, uh, Data Science Institute Ambassador and also a staff researcher. Uh, we have the pleasure here of having uh, Joshua Benjo here. He was kind enough to agree on giving a public talk to all the lab employees. I'm sure we have a lot of more people on the WebEx as well. So Joshua doesn't really need an introduction, but I'm going to do it just to keep the tradition. So Joshua Benjo is a full professor at University of Montreal, as well as founder and scientific director of Mila. He's widely considered as one of the world's leader in AI and deep learning, and he's the recipient of the 2018 Turing Award with Geoff Hilton and Jan LeCun. For those in the audience that are not computer scientists, that's pretty much our Nobel Prize. So it's a pretty big accomplishment. He's a fellow of both the Royal Society of London and Canada, an officer of the Order of Canada, Knight of the Legion of Honor of France, member of the United Nations Scientific Advisor, Advisor Board for Independent Advice on Breakthroughs in Science and Technology, and Canada Sci-Fi AI Chair. So I'm going to give the word now to our speaker. Thank you, and thank you all for coming. Thank you, Leno, for the kind words. Um, so today, um, I want to tell you about what has been uh, a big concern for me for a bit more than a year now, and that has really changed uh, my direction in research, as well as motivated me to speak publicly and, and talk to governments around the world so that we can uh, try to move the needle towards a safer world. Um, so I'll be mostly talking about large-scale risks that future AI systems could bring, not the ones that we have now, but thinking of the trajectory in which we are and uh, what could potentially go wrong and what we could potentially do in terms of research programs. Um, at least one direction that, that I'm uh, excited about. So there are many scenarios that various researchers have uh, been uh, writing about concerning how we could lose control of an AI system that might be stronger than us on various um, cognitive uh, abilities. Um, and I'm going to focus on one family of scenarios that I've chosen because I, um, that's the one I find the most concerning, but there are others. Uh, and I'm going to try to explain this in simple uh, analogies. Um, th this is a scenario that concerns AI systems that are trained with reinforcement learning, which is how we finalize the training of, of current uh, chatbots like ChatGPT. And for now, reinforcement learning methods are the only ways we know how to train AI systems that could have agency, in other words, that can carry out sequences of actions in order to achieve goals. They already are used to play games, for example, um, but, but uh, there's a huge investment in industry to develop these systems so that they can take roles in, uh, you know, in society, um, just like humans would eventually. So the way you would use something you know, like reinforcement learning to train your cat or your dog is by giving it rewards and punishments depending on its actions. For example, if you want to train your cat not to go on the kitchen table, you could just, you know, shout when, when it, it jumps on the table. And it will learn not to do it when you're in the kitchen. And that's a big problem. Not for cats, obviously. Don't put those. It's no big deal. Um, this is called misalignment. In other words, there is what you would like the entity to do, and you've given it signals so that it learns to do what you intend, what you would like, and there is what it ends up doing. In the case of the cat, it's because it has its own incentives, like, yeah, it wants food. So if it can find a way to cheat, and not get punished, it'll do it. And things like that 
could potentially happen with uh, AI systems. In fact, it's already happening, but just on the scale that doesn't matter, just like the cat. The question is, what happens when we use these methods to train, let's say, the equivalent of a grizzly bear that is more powerful than us? So in other words, when we train AI systems that are smarter than us, not necessarily on everything, but on enough things to harm people in, in a potentially catastrophic way. So if you go back to the bear analogy, how would you train a grizzly bear by giving it rewards when it behaves well? So fish, for example, like in the picture. By the way, this were, this were, these were drawn by a GPT-4. <laughs> um, so you could build a cage, right? In the case of AI, a cage is already something companies are building. They're trying to create safety protections so that the AI wouldn't do some of the things that it shouldn't do. Unfortunately, we don't know how to build sufficiently strong cages. Um, in the days or weeks after, you know, whatever AI system is released, um, open source is even more vulnerable, but even APIs like chat and GPT, uh, hackers, researchers find ways to hack the cage. Um, so let's, let's dig deeper into this scenario. So why would the bear go out of the cage? Because it can then control the access to the fish. It can just take the fish out of your hands. So what does it mean for AI? It means the AI takes control of the reward mechanism. So what is the reward mechanism? It's a piece of code sitting in the computer that say when it's plus one, it means it gets something good. If it's minus one, you know, it's bad. And so he wants to get more plus ones. And the way these systems are trained is to get as much plus ones as possible. That's how we, you know, this is, this is the, the, the mathematics of um, the, the uh, you know, behind the algorithms that, that uh, uh, really make them act so that they will get more positive rewards. And normally when we uh, think about these algorithms, we don't think about the possibility that the actions could be something that changes the code, right? But, but in the real world, if the AI is able to hack the computer on which it is sitting, then it becomes a possibility. Or even to influence people, like convince people to do something that you know, would end up with the same result. So, so then you could ask a number of interesting questions in this scenario, like, well, so what? Okay, so it controls its own rewards. So it's like a, an addict giving itself a lot of drug. Except that it's an addict that's smarter than you and doesn't want you to stop you know, it continuing to get its drug. And so, uh, well, it needs to make sure that uh, humans will not stop it, will not put it, back, put it back in the cage or turn it off. And how can it do that? Well, it could control us, maybe psychologically or politically or other ways, or it could get rid of us. These are all bad things. And I'm not saying these things are going to happen. There's just scenarios that are important. People who work, by the way, when I talk to people working in national security, they understand scenarios. Most people don't. They think it's science fiction. But the issue is, I haven't seen counter arguments that are convincing. In other words, there could also be good scenarios. We just don't know enough to, um, to be sure that only the good scenarios are going to happen. And we don't know enough to build the cages that are going to be guaranteed to be safe. Um, in, in this particular example, there are even worse things that they can say, like the, the bear is not going to escape the cage because it's smart until it knows that not only it can escape the cage, but it can take control of us. Because if it just escapes the cage and yeah, it, it gets some fish, but then we just kill it, right? That's not a good plan. And because we are thinking about superhuman intelligence, or at least as smart as us, I mean, you, if you were the bear, 
you would not escape. Even if you know how to escape, you would not do it until you also know that once you're out, you can stay out, right? And so what does that mean? It means that it will look tame for a while until it finds a way to both escape and get rid of us or control us. Um, and so some of the methods that we're currently using, like red teaming and evaluations for AI, it's likely that they're going to, you know, tell us, oh, it's getting better and better. Like it's, it's becoming safer and safer. It looks like it's behaving well. It's doing the things that we want. It's, be it's acting in more moral ways. But that's just because that's the best thing it can do until it finds or act upon such a plan to escape and, and take control, right? So you might ask, well, um, how can we avoid that? Um, uh, so there, there are two parts to really dealing with this and need to get both of them right. One is scientific and the other is political. So the scientific part is how do we build a cage that's really, really safe? even against an entity that is smarter than us. And that's something a little bit mind-boggling, right? So if you think about cybersecurity, for example, uh, how do I write code that a smarter programmer, you know, will not be able to break into? It better be foolproof, right? It better be actually mathematical guarantees that this code is not breakable because math, you know, doesn't allow loopholes, hopefully. Otherwise, it's not good math. Um, the other issue is, is political. Why do I say that? Because even if we knew how to build a safe cage, we still need to make sure that every baby bear is put in a safe cage before it becomes big. And that's laws, that's international treaties. Um, that's incentives for companies to, to do the right things. That's political. Um, and there is also the last line here, that regulation and treaties are gonna reduce the chances of bad things happening. If, if we do them right. But they're not going to be 100% protections either. So if you think longer term, even if we reduce the chances of bad things by a factor of 100, it may be that at some point, I don't know, North Korea gets to do its thing and they didn't sign the treaty, right? Or they didn't, don't actually intend to follow it. And they do a mistake or they use AI to, to attack us in various ways. And, and we end up with a rogue AI, like an AI system that autonomously wants to do bad things to us, either because of humans behind it or because they lost control. So even with regulation, even if we know how to build an AI system, we also need to worry about how do we defend in case a rogue AI emerges at some point after humans collectively know how to build superhuman intelligence. Okay, so the, these are really tough challenges. We don't know how to do any of these things. But we have some, no, we, there are things we know that can, you know, move us in the right direction. Okay, um, so I, I talked about uh, how to counter a future superhuman, I know I didn't. I said there, there could be a future superhuman AI that is, uh, has bad goals. Um, how do we defend against something like this? Well, we have the traditional national security infrastructure, but, but now we're talking about, about an adversary that's smarter than any human. And I don't see personally how we can succeed with you know, good chances of survival unless we also have, as part of our team, a superhuman AI. Right, so, so there's a sense in which this is saying 
we need to figure out how to build AIs that are smarter than us and will not escape the cage, in other words, that are safe, before someone else does something stupid and creates a dangerous entity that could attack us so that we can defend using those protective AIs. At least that's a reasoning I have, and you know, I'm happy to discuss any holes you see in my reasoning. You know, if you can make me sleep better at night, I'll be grateful. Um, so if we were to build such protective AIs, of course, they, they, we need to figure out the scientific answers to how we, 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 we build those safe AIs. But we also need to make sure that the AIs, these AIs, these potentially superhuman AIs will be secure and in safe hands. Because again, even if we know the recipe, if it falls in the wrong hands, somebody might just open the cage or somebody might, you know, not do it right or use it against us. So these, these are all scenarios that we need to worry about. And there's also the issue that the people who build the AI that is supposed to protect us could be tempted by the power that that superhuman AI would give them. Right? Humans are, you know, greedy and power is attractive, not to mention money. And so the governance that we're going to put around these AGI systems is going to be very important. We need to make sure that no single person, not even no single government can any any centralized decision making like no entity that has decision making power can alone do something that end up ends up being really bad for everyone else so we need a very strong multi stakeholder multilateral democratic governance of these systems when we reach that point or before we reach that point to reduce the chances of any form of abuse of that or somebody just doing the wrong thing. Um, there are all sorts of interesting geopolitical, geopolitical questions around all this, of course. Um, one of them is non-proliferation. So if AI becomes powerful enough, it becomes a weapon. You know, if I, if I say that an AI can do bad things, well, it is a weapon. It is also a way to make a lot of money, of course. It's different from usual weapons. Um, and there are questions like, depending on the kind of uh, forms of attack, or different, depending on the kind of threat, it, the balance of the advantage to the attacker versus the defender are going to change the nature of the game. Uh, and if the attacker has generally the advantage, then having more AGIs is going to increase the risks. Um, but but there, you know, this is something, this is a, this is a line of thinking that needs more work. Because um, if we're thinking about what can go wrong and what kind of uh, arrangement, for example, if we have multiple good AGIs in the hands of governments that are doing the right thing, and there's one rogue AGI that shows up, how do we make sure that together they can better defend? And they probably need to coordinate in order to do that. So this is also connected to what I said about multilateral governance. All right, now let's go a little bit more into potential solutions. So first I'm gonna talk about a kind of AI which could be incredibly useful to humanity, but not dangerous, which is great. Um, and it's simply what I initially called AI scientists and now I called scientists AI to avoid the confusion, to, to design AIs whose main purpose or his main, uh, des, you know, the, the, the design principles are really imitate in a way how human scientists work. So in other words, they're not agents. They're not doing things in the world. They're just trying to understand how things work to come up with explanations for why things have happened the way they have. 
You can think of AI systems that write scientific papers. I mean, we already see how good with language uh, current chatbots are. But uh, we could imagine in some number of generations that they could not be just good with language, but also with science and be coming to you know their own ideas and their own conclusions that are basically better explanations or alternative explanations for some of the questions that science asks. So such AIs could help scientists to solve some of the major challenges we have and you know in medicine, in the environment, um, uh, education and, and, and many other things. So clearly that would be useful. Um, it would be even more useful if the way that these AIs generate their hypotheses is something that humans can understand. Because, uh, of course, how do we use the, the, that output if it's not understandable by us? But there's a bug with this. Uh, in order to get like 100% safety with what I'm, talk what I'm talking about, these basically would only be like theoretical scientists. They don't do anything. They, they can they can suggest uh, experiments, but they wouldn't be doing them because we don't want to be we don't want them to be agents to make sure they don't do things that are harmful. But we might need AI agents to protect us. So this thing I was talking about earlier that you know one day if rogue superhuman AIs arise, we need superhuman AIs that would be safe and protect us. Well, these AIs to protect us, they, they need to be able to act on their own. Like imagine there is a sort of cyber battle well, that means the AI on our side needs to act by itself, autonomously, on our behalf. So it's not enough to have AIs that understand the world. Um, we also need them to act in the world. Okay, so... Uh, yeah, let me skip this. Um, so let me talk about um, Bayesian things. So first of all, the, there are issues with the way that we're currently training AI systems. Uh, mostly we train them with what's called maximum likelihood and reinforcement learning. Uh, ChatGPT, for example, has a first phase where it's trained to imitate the text that people write, and that's maximum likelihood. And the second phase where it learns to do things that humans would like based on human feedback, and that's reinforcement learning. And both of these processes um, can lead to systems that are confidently wrong. In other words, believe that some action or some answer is right, even though it's wrong. Um, humans do that too, especially if they have a big ego. Um, and it's not good for safety, right? So if, if, if an action or an answer is wrong, you'd like at least to have some doubts. You shouldn't be sure of something if you're not sure, right? If you don't have proof or you don't have sufficient evidence. But, but, but currently, you know, this is what we, we are seeing sometimes. Um, in the case of reinforcement learning, there's another issue, which is that um, the system may be optimizing something that isn't quite right. Is this connected to the misalignment problem I talked about with the cat? So uh, by searching for a solution to a problem that optimizes something that is slightly wrong, that is not exactly what we want, the AI system and we've seen in sort of toy scenarios, is likely to find something that is too good to be true. Right. So if uh, if you if you if you walk around and you know you you think you found something that's worth a million dollar on the ground, maybe you didn't put your glasses right. I'm gonna say it's too good to be true. Uh, and if you look hard enough and you your you know glasses are a bit wrong you will find something that's too good to be true. It's almost uh, almost certain. So what, what can we do to protect 
uh, our AI systems from this sort of overconfidence of doing the right thing and then potentially doing something very bad. So this is where the idea of Bayesian machine learning comes. I'm going to try to explain it in uh, simple terms. The, the basic issue we're trying to address is that for almost anything in trying to understand the world around us, there is uncertainty about what is the right explanation. You know, in science, you may have multiple theories that are compatible with the data, and the scientists will disagree, um, or they, they will actually design experiments to try to separate the good from the bad theories. And what I've been saying about maximum likelihood and reinforcement learning, the current sort of leading ways of training our AIs, is that really what's going on is these systems may pick one of the interpretations, one of the theories, if you want, one way to understand the world. And there's no guarantee that they're going to be kind of taking into account the diversity of potential explanations beyond the one that they've liked. So in other words, the mathematically what happens is that these neural nets that we're training now, they have a training objective, which basically has to do with fitting the data, being consistent with the data. But there may be multiple ways of fitting the data, multiple ways of explaining the data. In fact, we can train, if we initialize a neural net from a different random initialization, we're going to get a different neural net that will not always provide the same answer. Right. So, so you know, which one should we listen to? Well, the answer is we should, we should listen to all of them. Okay, let, let me look at this little example here to illustrate what I mean. Imagine you, you have a robot that has a very simple binary decision to take. Take the left door or the right door. But based on the data that it has seen up to now, there are two uh, theories about the world that are consistent with that data, and they provide different answers as to what to expect from the left door and the right door. So the, the left bubble is sort of what the uh, one of the theories says, and the right bubble is one of the uh, the other theory and and if you did maximum likelihood training you know, would just have randomly picked one of these now one of the theories says if you go to the left door you die or you kill somebody let's say in the case of the ai um and right door you get some cake which the the other theory says oh actually left door is good you get some cake right door nothing good nothing bad all right let me do let me make you work here which door do you take? The right door? Yes. That's it. How did you come to that conclusion? No catastrophic outcome. Well, you, you want to look for any theory that says this door is really bad and you don't want to take that door. Right? And we do that. Like if you're driving a car in the mountain in the night, you don't take a path that, you know, maybe with a small chance could lead to a very terrible accident, like, you know, a truck coming in the other direction you didn't hear or see. Even the way it's a small probability, right? You, there's a sort of worst case analysis going on in your brain when you're taking risks into consideration. And the other thing is somehow you need to account for the different possibilities of explanations for here, you know, what could happen so that you can do these kinds of calculations. So you, you can formalize these ideas. Um, and maybe this is not the right level for, for, for this audience, but I'm going to try to to, to uh, explain this. Um, um, so, so first of all, there's something important, which is we don't know what is the true nature of reality. We don't know what is the right explanation for everything. Um, that's what I call T star here. But we could imagine uh, 
a large enough set of theories. For example, all the theories that you can write down in uh, math or you know equations and so on. That is not limited by a particular size. So potentially, the correct theory could be expressed in that language. So the set of all these theories, you know, I call uh, their T for theories for theory. Um, and T star is the one we don't know, but it is correct. Capital D here is all the data that the AI has seen. So uh, there's something interesting, which is that as you see more and more data, and so this is what the first proposition, as you see more and more data, the probability of the correct interpretation is going to be greater or equal to the probability of any other interpretation, any other theory. So there could be multiple theories that are consistent with the data, but the good one is among those that have the highest Bayesian posterior probability. All right. so that's good. And you can use that to prove the second thing, which is that the probability of harm that could occur for the true theory, for according to the true theory, which we don't know, can be bounded, it, it's, it's going to be less or equal to the probability of harm under a kind of paranoid theory, capital T. So this paranoid theory is one that we can potentially compute. It looks at, you know, it's the equation on the second line. It's, it's a theory that is both predicting that something bad will happen and is plausible. In other words, it's among those theories that are consistent with the data. So one way to think about it is imagine you had a committee of 100 people and they're all wise and they're all like doing things that are consistent with everything we know. So you could just ask uh, them to vote on what to do. And maybe the majority thinks that we should take the left door or I guess the left door. Uh, but if one of them says actually don't take the left door because you're going to die. You should not take the left door. Right. Even though it's a minority voice, by the way, that's uh, speaking in favor of uh, diversity and inclusion. Um, like we need diversity in that committee that covers all the things that are plausible. And then we need to take a sort of wor worst case analysis here, like among all the theories uh, is there one that says something bad is going to happen if we do this? So if, if we were able to do these calculations, to estimate these probabilities and to do this optimization problem, then we would have some form of guarantees. Um, they are asymptotic guarantees, unfortunately. Uh, but, but it's already better than no guarantees, which is currently what we have. So the, the research program that I'm... Um, that I've started uh, tries to uh, exploit this direction. Um, it's interesting to compare what I'm talking about here with how we're currently doing AI safety. The way that we're currently trying to make sure the AI systems we build are safe is like spot checks. Um, like we tell things to the bear hoping that it's going to make it do bad behavior. And the problem with that is we can't really try everything. There's, a, there's an exponentially large number of contexts. We can't test all these contexts. So we have lots of humans trying things. It's called red teaming. And that's good, but it's insufficient. So if, if the people, if the red teams find a problem, and we know we have a problem, and maybe we can fix it. If the red teams don't find anything, then we don't know. We just don't know if, if, if the AI is safe. So what can we do? Well, we could do a dynamic safety check. In other words, for each action that the AI is taking, we, we try to evaluate whether that action is dangerous. Because in the static case, where we, as, which is currently how like NIST is planning to do things, and also the UK AI Safety Institute, 
we take a trained model and then we kind of try to make it do something bad, right? Um, but there's an exponential number of contexts, as I said. There's no way we'll be able to cover all the cases. However, the number of cases that actually happen in the real world, that is limited. So for each case in which the AI is called, if we have a way to check, oh, this is going to be OK, then, then we don't have this problem of, well, we didn't check everything. We just need to check everything that actually happens. And there we go. So if we had something like what I said before, that evaluates the policy of harm given an action, or at least has a sort of uh, conservative bound on the policy of harm, then we could do that. Um, so this leaves open many questions. That one of them is, how do we get all these like Bayesian posterior conditional probabilities? Um, it's believed, it's been believed for a long time that, uh, and I believe that until recently, that these Bayesian calculations are intractable. And, and so people have kind of given up on doing these sorts of calculations. But, but, um, but, but I do suspect now that there are ways to estimate them. So what we would potentially get at the end of the day are neural networks that approximate these, these conditional probabilities. And it turns out that, um, so in the last few years, for other reasons, we developed these generative flow networks, or G-flow nets. And there are variants of reinforcement learning, which instead of trying to find an answer to a question that maximizes some reward function, they will give you randomly answers sampled from a distribution proportional to the reward function. So things that have a high reward will come more often. Things that have a low reward will come less often. Things that have a zero reward should not come at all. So why is that useful? Well, it's actually useful in, in scientific discovery when you want to explore many solutions to a problem. But it turns out here that if we choose the reward function to be quantities that we can compute, uh, some, you know, the prior, which is something like, oh, we like data here is, is a theory, right? We like theories that are simple, that are short. And the other factor here is P of data given theory or likelihood. That is something we can compute. It's how well, how consistent is the theory with the data, which is normally what we compute when we train neural nets. Normally, we just maximize this. But if instead of maximizing it, we sample proportionally to it, the theories about the things we care about, then we get a Bayesian posterior. OK. Um, it doesn't completely solve our problem because ah. we, for now, we only know how to do this on a small scale, and and we need to figure out how to do answer similar questions on a bigger scale, where the theories are very big, for example. But it it, it suggests that there's a way to do these things. Um, I see that time is flying, and I'm going to skip a lot of uh, things. Um, let me tell you about one aspect we've been working on recently. These GFlow nets, as they have been developed, have been developed for uh, sampling discrete objects, like sequences of symbols, graphs, for example, causal graphs, uh, discrete data structures, you know, trees, or things like that. But in order to come up with theories about things that can work in the world, we need to also generate real valued objects, like big vectors, like parameter vectors. And and, and the standard g flats are not very good for that. Um, so in the last year, more or less, we've been working on, on these kinds of uh, uh, methods similar to g flats nets um, but that would work on generating high dimensional vectors for uh, doing this kind of Bayesian calculations I talked about. 
Um, and yeah, I, I, I don't want to get into too much of the, of the weeds here, but there's more and more work in that direction. And you probably have heard about diffusion processes. Maybe you didn't, but the images like, you know, the, the bear you saw, um, that people use to generate images using, you know, uh, people use GPT-4 and other methods, DALI and so on, to generate images. They all use th these diffusion uh, methods. Um, and so what we've done in a recent paper is find a way to apply similar ideas to the problem of generating uh, vectors with a probability proportional to some reward function. So this is different from the normal way of training. In machine learning, normally we directly fit the data. We're looking for, um, uh, for example, uh, a, a neural net that will generate images such that they give they, they, they have a high probability of generating the images in the training set. If you want to be Bayesian, the problem is a bit different. You're trying to generate uh, a, a neural net that will generate images um, uh, that 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 fit well the data, such that you choose these neural nets with higher probability when they fit the data better. It's a it, and and so up to now we didn't know how to do these things, but but we have found ways to apply basically the some of the diffusion ideas and the GFLNet ideas. In, in the same package. If you are curious about the work on GFLONET, I've uh, written a tutorial with the help of a lot of people, and you can find it online easily by typing GFLONET tutorial um, or following this, this link. Um, one of the properties that I would like to highlight about the things that I've talked about has to do with computational resources. So in the example with the grizzly bear where things go bad, there's a really nasty property that I didn't highlight, which is the smarter the bear, the more likely it finds a plan to escape and kill people. In other words, as we increase the computational resources we put into AI, the risk of something bad happening increases if we follow that scenario, at least. It would be good if with more compute, we would get more safety instead. And this is true of, of what I've been talking about, because these, these guarantees for safety that I talked about, they rely on um, a, a training large neural nets. And the more we train it, the bigger it is, the better the safety guarantees will be. So now compute becomes something that works for us rather than, rather than against us. All right, I will, uh, I will stop here and uh, I hope this uh, makes you think and ask questions. Thanks.